Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. My guest today is Martine Batchelor, a Buddhist teacher and author who conducts regular meditation retreats and seminars worldwide. She's going to talk to us today about ethics from a Buddhist perspective. Hello, Martine. Welcome to the MWS podcast. Hello. Happy to be here. (laughs) Okay, can we start off by you telling us a bit about your background and, and the work that you do? Okay, so I uh, was a Zen Korean nun for 10 years in Korea where I practiced meditation. Yeah. And then uh, I stopped being a nun and I returned to live in England and I lived in different uh, community associated with different um, centers like Gaia House. Yeah. And now I live in France and I travel to teach meditation. I have also written books. And one particularly might be interesting in terms of the topic is uh, the path of compassion, yeah. which actually is a translation I did of the Bodhisattva precepts. Okay. And uh, so I translated it because uh, as monks and nuns, we recite it regularly. Yeah. And I could see that the text was really influencing the way the monastic lived. Yeah. And that's why I translated it. Okay, yeah, we can touch on that. So, um, well, let's start then. How does Buddhist ethics differ from the more rule-based ethics of, say, the monotheistic religions and Kantian ethics? Well, I think we have to, you know, to look in, in terms of ethics. In a way, you have many different ideas about what first ethic is, yeah. what it is about, and what is it looking at. And so even within, I would say, monotheistic religions, you have different ways to look at ethics, which some were more rule-based, some were less rule-based, and then you have different Kantian ethics and different type of ethics. But personally, I think I am not interested in the theory of it. I am more interested, in a way, in... How does it work? Okay. So if we look at ethics, basically we realize, it seems to me, because of course there are different people who have different ideas. I read this very interesting book, Justice, by Michael G. Sandor. And that was a very interesting book where he looked at ethics and justice in many different ways. Yeah. So the book is very good. And it makes you see that there are a lot of different ideas. But personally, I would, I would think it's really about relationship. What is ethic about? I think it's about relationship. How do I relate to myself? How do I relate to others? Yeah. And then from a Buddhist point of view, often, for example, like the Bodhisattva precept, are seen as a liberating factor. So are we seeing ethics and precepts as rule and regulation, and then the question is, how do we follow them or not? Mm-hmm. How is it possible? Or are we looking at what is the purpose of ethics? To have, what I would say, a wise and compassionate relationship to myself and to others. Okay. What is interesting in terms of, the, for example, the text of Bodhisattva Crescent, which is, one could say, one branch of Maya, Mahayana ethics, is that in Korea, they, there was this teacher who had this talk where he said, we need to know how to open or close the door of ethics. And so here he was saying, we need to have an ethical attitude, but then how is it going to be like strictly enforced or is it according to conditions? Yeah, and, so, um, and what do you mean by conditions? By condition, I mean the fact that things depend on other things. Yeah. 
things don't things are interrelated things are uh, connected to other things so personally i mean my personal belief nowadays due to meditation practice about ethics is a question what is it that makes us unethical okay because most of the time people are fairly ethical but upon certain condition they might not be and then it's interesting to look at what are the conditions and especially if you take it in term of uh, some other type of ethics because i think it depends on the feeling tone pleasant and pleasant neutral and how you react grasp or creatively engage with them okay that might be a new term for some of our listeners could you explain a bit more detail what feeling tone is so feeling tone is basically uh why the connection with condition is the buddha generally one of the major buddha of the idea is about the fact that you have contact through the senses with different things yeah. what you see what you hear etc and upon that contact you have a feeling tone a basic feeling tone pleasant and pleasant or neutral neither pleasant nor unpleasant yeah. and generally the feeling tone impels us to act and as the buddha says one of the difficulties that we grasp at the pleasant feeling tone we push away the unpleasant feeling tone and we confuse by neutral feeling tone Okay. But if you look back in terms of ethics, if somebody kills somebody or if somebody harms somebody, why is that? A lot of the time it's re- in reaction to an unpleasant feeling tone. Uh-huh. If somebody wants to rob a bank, often it might be in connection with the pleasant feeling tone which could arise if they have lots of money. What's your view of karma in the sense of cosmic justice oh i think this is a very very dodgy term you know cosmic justice i think is really something you want to avoid using this term i think it's very dangerous term actually and why why because i mean then we come to the to it's very interesting this idea of justice what is justice about you know is it that we suffer each to the same degree is it that we try to be fair to each other you see justice is kind of like you know i think often uh, there is this very strong and nowadays feeling of fairness things must be fair mm-hmm. and then of course if you use karma as is you know in the end they will get their karma pants I, i i think personally it's a little uh, problematic especially cosmic like you know the cosmos is going to do it i think it's very problematic there is one text in the sutta where the buddha says there is a reason for why you experience something yeah and only one was karmic fruit the rest is uh flame disorder bile disorder wind disorder disorder of the three weather condition uh, accident heedlessness and the eighth karmic retribution you could say yeah karmic retribution so i think we karma actually the term just mean work in operation basically it's saying you know you do something there is a result okay so it's we have to be careful if the to put, to move cause and effect to the idea of cosmic justice because then you have to experience what has the cosmos to do about it and then you have to explain what is justice about because many different people have different idea about justice yeah a lot of people associate buddhism with with this concept though don't they but i think there's also a movement that is changing it. to what degree is that changing do you think well you see i think all religion i think we have to be careful that all religion have different aspects 
And some aspect is about helping us in some ways to deal with the unfairness of life, with the pain of life, possibly with the fear of death. So then you have, in a way, many creation myths, or you have many afterlife myths, or whatever story you create, yeah. in order to, to kind of make sense within the culture. And I think, in a way, with the idea of karma, taking it in a kind of like a popular manner, I think it can be actually very uncompassionate. Mm -hmm. You could just say, oh, too bad, it's your karma. Yeah. That's not very compassionate. And then for this reason, in some country, in some Buddhist country, they have not done as much for people, for example, who were disabled or whatever, with this idea, oh, it's their karma, if they work hard in this life, their next life, maybe they'll have a better rebirth. Yeah. But personally, I think, again, this is a very, very dodgy way of looking at things. Yeah. And I, I had a, an experience with a nun saying, you know, we need to help everybody, regardless of our belief in this or that. So I think karma is a good idea in terms of cause and effect, yeah. but it's not a good idea in terms of retribution. Yeah, I, I agree with you there, uh, Martine. Um, for, for many people, ethics is either viewed in absolute terms, telling us what is right or wrong in some final way, or it's simply relative, only reflecting our own opinions or, the, or those of the group that we belong. Does Buddhist ethics in some way steer a course between these two extremes? Possibly. Again, you know, you have to see that in Buddhism you have a wide range. So you have a really a wide range of things. But I would say it's, it's trying to be not too rule and regulation. Yeah. And at the same time, it's not just everything is relative. Because I think you have, I would say, you need, in order to have ethics, you need the notion of values. And so if you look at the Eightfold Path, and you have uh, this, you know, Sama and Samaditi, etc., etc., and Sama, S-A-M-M-A, generally is translated as right. Yeah. You can translate it more as complete, authentic, appropriate, skillful. Mm -hmm. But basically, the Buddha set up saying, to, to, it's not any mindfulness, it's not any thought, it's not any speech. It's skillful. It's appropriate. It's authentic. And what is interesting is to look at the definition for appropriate thought, for example. Yeah. Appropriate thought intention is a translation generally. And it's a appropriate thought intention is a thought guided by non ill will, harmlessness, and renunciation. And then again and again you find that in the Buddha when he speaks about different things. What is the point of doing something? The point is to cause no harm. That, I mean, this is really the first point, to cause no harm. Okay. But then, of course, you have the question, you know, how do I know I cause harm? And sometimes, I mean, it's kind of get a little complicated. And I think that's where you can open or close a precept. Yeah. So in the Zen tradition, you have the famous one of, because in the Zen, in the Buddhist tradition, generally, you should not lie and you should not kill. Okay. And so you have the famous story about you have somebody who is in the forest, they see a deer flying right, the hunter comes and says, where did the deer go? And the fellow said, he went left. So, in a way, the fellow breaks the precept in terms of lying, but follow the precept in terms of saving a life. Okay. Saving the deer. So I think... In a way, there is this two idea about ethics. It's kind of like there is some value. I think, you know, for, to have ethics, you need to have value. You need to have, for example, you would have the value of wisdom, the value of compassion. So then an ethical attitude would be about what is it 
that helps me to be more wise and to be more compassionate. What are the conditions that allow me to do that? How can I be more like that? Or what are the conditions which stop me from being like that? Yeah. Um, in the last few years, engaged Buddhism has gained a wider audience. Uh, by having to use the term engaged, is there not an implication here that traditional Buddhism has failed in some way in terms of ethics? Well, again, you have to be careful here, because what are you looking at? If you're looking at the last hundred years, actually Buddhism hundred years ago was fairly in the doldrum, was in a very bad place. So actually... Buddhism could not really show what it did, or people did not see what it did. Because what is interesting in Thailand is that now the monks are doing lots of meditation or study, and a friend who is a, an engaged Buddhist actually say, well, before they had more things to do, because before they served at hospital, before they served at education center. Ah. But now the secular society as of secular hospital, as secular education. So then the monks are left with less to do. So in a way, like if you look back in the Chinese history, you have a period of time where Buddhism was actually very compassionately active in many different ways. And if you had gone, I read a book, wonderful book, about the 1800 in China, and if you'd gone to a temple, to a monastery, you would actually, it would be like a zoo nearly, because, because they have this injunction in the Bodhisattva precept of not arming yeah. such a being, then people would give their old animal, farm animal, to the, to the monastery. So we would have old car, old horses, old donkey, mm -hmm. and the monks would take care of them. So I think, in a way, why engage Buddhism? I think it's actually more because of modern society and also because the monks and the nuns, either due to politics, because of the changing nature, like in Korea, Buddhism was repressed for 700 years until the 1950s, nearly, you could say 1910, the Japanese came in, but that created its own problem, then 1950, you could say, Buddhism was revived. Okay. So I mean, they could not do much engagement for 700 years. They were forbidden to get into the capital. And so if you go to different Buddhist country, you will have different Buddhist circumstances, yeah. which yeah. allow them or not to help people out. Okay. Well, we talked about non-harming. Here's one situation. Imagine you, um, imagine you have a, a company and the company is not doing very well at all. And you, say you've got 100 employees. And to save the company, you're going to have to lay 10 people off. Obviously, you're going to harm them in, in a sense because they're going to lose their job, but you're going to save the, the job of the 90 other people. How, how does that tie in with non-harming? Well, again, you see, I think the, the concept, that's where I was saying, the concept of non-harming, to me, in a way, to follow what Gandhi said, because he said, we will cause harm anyway, can we try to cause the least harm? Right. So then the question is, in any situation, you have many different parameters. Yeah. And then it depends. You see, the, the boss could decide to earn less money. The boss could decide to have less of a bonus. The boss could decide to be more creative. So is, I mean, you could have... The looking at, oh, I have to get rid of 10 people. This is possibly the easy solution, the easy short-term solution. Can you think in a long term? I mean, you see, I think you can, you can look at it in so many different ways. I'm sure, yeah. So I think it's kind of like, yes, you can, you know, dismiss 10 people. But then nowadays we have lots of law that if you dismiss people, uh, generally they protect it. But you see, in France... You had companies who wanted to get rid of people, and in order not to pay their compensation, they would be really nasty to them, so the people would resign without compensation. See. 
Again, you have what are the parameters, what are the conditions in which it happens. Yeah. So, but would it be more appropriate to say, instead of don't cause harm, try to cause at least harm, uh, as least harm as possible? Considering what you know at the time. Yeah. Because you see, this is, in a way, what is interesting in terms of Buddhism. You look at the intention, you look at the action, and you look at the result of the action. And so within these three parameters, you can have many different ways. You can have a good intention, you can have a good action, and you can have a bad result. You can have a bad intention, you can have a good action, you can have a good result. I mean, you, you know, with these three parameters, you can have many different things going on. And so it's kind of looking at each point. What is the intention? What is the action? What is the result? Okay, what about punishment from a Buddhist ethical perspective? For example, prison. Should prison be a, a, a retributive thing or a restorative thing or a mixture? Or... You see, I think if we, look, if we look at, you know, people, this is then you look at ethical. You see, that's what the Book of Justice of Sandal is about. You have personal ethics, where I do what I don't do. Yeah. And in Buddhism, you have the concept of hiri and otapa. Hiri is trying not to be ashamed of oneself. And otapa is fear of doing something which will be seen as shameful by others. And they see seen as kind of, you know, helping basically self-respect and other respect. So if you live in a society, then it's kind of like, what are the ethics of that society? And generally, you know, you try to live in a peaceful society, let's say, and some people, for whatever reason, will commit murder, will commit robbery, will do all kinds of things. And so the question is that, in a way, you want, you want these people to stop it. So I would say that's the first function, often, yep. is to stop the people doing it again and again and again. And then, of course, there is a question of punishment, or is it like kind of a way to stop the people from doing it? That's what, personally, I think that's one of the main function of prison, is put people there so they cannot do it. And then the question is, is it then then to make them, uh, to punish them for, for it, or is it that you're going to try to make it so that they would not do it again? So then it could be like prison could be more like educational place where people could change. Yeah. But recently I was reading an article, like in America, they don't have much parole nowadays, but at some point there was parole. And so even people who had committed murder could have parole, though it's not possible anymore. So now you have these people who have been in prison for a long time. They are like in the 60s, 70s, they've been in prison for 25 years. And actually some of them over that period have changed because they've started to implement something to help people to change. So they have changed. And so they committed this horrible thing and now they are different. And then the question is, should they continue to suffer no matter what? Or can we accept that they can change, although they did something horrible? Hmm. But then you also have people who might not change. Whatever you try, who might not change. Because Stephen, my husband, was a Buddhist chaplain. And you can see some people change, and some people do not seem to have much intention of changing. Okay, yeah. Um, my last question, Martin. What is your understanding of the middle way? And how does it relate to what we've been talking about today? Yeah, I think the idea of the Buddha was not to be too indulgent, basically not to do everything we wanted to do, and at the same time not to be too ascetic and restrictive, because that creates its own problem. So he saw that there was a problem with I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, because then it's not like if everybody does that, then it's not going to be like a harmonious society. So it's basically about how can we live together 
in such a way that actually we can cultivate ourselves and help with the cultivation of others. Mm -hmm. And basically it's about how can I develop wisdom and compassion myself and how can I help others to develop wisdom and compassion too. And then in terms of the restraint, I think to restrain oneself is important if suddenly you go into causa. Like if you know that if you drink a glass of alcohol, you're going to go on a bender and then you might, you know, damage to yourself or attack someone else. Yeah. Then it's a good idea to say, I am not going to have that drink because knowing the consequences of that. But if you constantly in, I am not going to do this, I'm not going to do this more from a theoretical point of view, then generally you will get into tension and often something else will come out. Because you see, in the appropriate intention, you have the idea of renunciation. But what is renunciation about? Often it's presented as, I'm going to renounce something to show I am a tough guy or a tough lady and I will resist. But personally, I think the middle way is to actually realize, do I need to do this? Do I really need to do this? And to really, in a way, see the, the pointlessness or the danger, but in a such a way which is creative. So it doesn't leave you just saying no to something, but actually seeing the emptiness of it or the pointlessness of it, deciding to do something else. Because the problem is that if you stay in restriction, then at some point you're going to go into something else because you need to have expression. So it's between restriction and too much expression and be more in the middle way, which personally I would call, how can I creatively engage? Okay. With as much wisdom and compassion I can muster, considering the inner and outer conditions. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that, Martin. It's been really interesting. Good. Okay. You can find out more about Middleway Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org.